Hello and welcome back to this free episode it's of... It's the free one. I didn't even get through the name of the podcast. No, you didn't. It's, no. it's going to get more advanced each time until we finally begin each episode with, it's the free one. Yep. One day even I'm... the bonuses. No, either that or like enough of the listeners will kind of just say at some point that it's cringe and then we'll just pretend it never happened. Uh, mm. it yep. was, no. Yeah, like it, like it was That's never a thing. I don't care what they think. I'm not interested. <laughs> My- a podcast in which the future, uh, you, you know, we must yeah, do you know, the free you know one. The Otherwise, the future why- is or will be trash. Yeah, if you want to write in and be like, why can't you guys be more like the McElroys? I'm not interested. I don't want to yeah. hear it. Mm. Uh, our, our beans juice. Uh, boy, do we have an episode for you today, however. Our beans. It's the free one. Uh, before I sort of, we sort of continue with the uh, sort of opening of the episode capering that we're sort of contractually required mm. to do, um, I first want to uh, introduce our guest for today, is uh, Maria Norris, who is an academic in uh, terrorism and security studies, uh, who has long studied uh, the government's prevent program. Maria, how's it going? Oh, I'm very excited to trash prevent on trash future. Ah, we good. tricked oh, yeah. another smart person into yeah. coming on our stupid <laughs> show for morons. Yeah, that's right. Mm. And uh, and now we shall be uh, wasting her time for a little while. Uh, yeah. We're not like those squares over at my brother, my brother and me. We don't like to ask the big <laughs> questions like they do. <laughs> no, uh, so... Um, I, I've been excited to talk. We've been wanting to do an episode about prevent for a while, uh, and... I think we can consider this a little bit of a, spir- a spiritual sequel to our episode with Daniel Trilling about the home office as a sort of a worked example, taking some of those ideas further. But before we so get into open that... open your trash future workbooks. <laughs> yeah. God. If, 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 you know what, the if Riley the, lecture course. If the rest of you all weren't here, there would be a TF like workbook that you would have to follow. <laughs> yeah. It'd be like, there'd be like stickers of big guys you had to put on one page. Yeah, I think that'd no. be fun. Um, No, uh, but we have to do some, there are a few items that have been occurring in the news that I want to talk about first. Um, I hate when there's items occurring in the news. Alice, you like this one. Okay. Because. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes. 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 But in a heading I've just titled, uh, Justice at the Commemorative Coin Dispute. (laughs) Um, People who uh, have listened to this show will know. He's fucking wrong. People who listen to this show will know uh, that. We have long uh, been following a uh, a man from the West Country uh, who has been attempting. Oh, is he from the West Country? Yeah, I didn't he's, know from, that. Uh, he's from he's from uh, he's from Exeter, uh, mm-hmm. who has been attempting to fill up his car and then some jerry cans with petrol, but then paying using commemorative coins and recording it like a sort of sovereign citizen. The most mm-hmm. annoying yeah. man on YouTube. He's the truest kind of sovereign citizen in that he's trying to play with gold sovereigns. <laughs> so. He and basically he went. He he would keep going to places, trying to pay for stuff with I don't know, like a coin that like you know like remembers when uh, Prince Philip got his first adrenochrome shot or whatever, yeah, a doubloon, yeah. something of that. But nature. trying to pay with with one of these commemorative coins and then being told to fuck off quite reasonably has now been paid five thousand pounds because he was wrongfully arrested. But but uh, yes. in in what sort of denomination did they pay this five thousand pounds to him? Is my question. Oh yes, yeah. yes. Uh, Diana and Charles' wedding commemorative coins <laughs> only for this man's five k. Yeah, he got a plate that somehow has a face value, <laughs> uh, and then and then they're like, "Well, you have to accept them." Yeah, it's legal tender, which this case has proven, which is fine. He can yeah. he can pay for anything <laughs> with anything. Um, well, is that what the case has proven though, or is it just said that they weren't allowed to arrest him? It's not necessarily said that he's right. Well, it's that, um, so now he's don't, demanding- Don't, don't, don't take away from this man's absolute incredible moment of triumph at the hands of our courts. Yeah. It's the, the first that, that time- a man in, That a man in a wig and a robe has sat down, poured over this and gone, actually, you know what? When you took that 60 quid commemorative coin to Tesco service station to try and pay with petrol, that was not something with which the law should concern itself. <laughs> yeah, awesome. I had a very similar situation to this happen when, I used to, when my parents like, had the shop. 
and there was a customer who came in who had like one of those old five pound coins. Mm. Um, but you couldn't oh. take it because like you couldn't like it wouldn't be able to be processed, right? Like because the current like you couldn't use that currency. Um, mm. but they were so insistent that they could buy like their day they, they could buy like their like daily shopping using that coin that they stayed in the shop for the entire morning. Um, until, <laughs> until my dad, the manager in this situation came in and then complained to my dad for another two hours so that he could use the five pound coin. And my dad was ultimately just like, okay, fine. Just, you know, we'll take it. You know, it's all good. Um, yeah. Another victory, another victory in YouTube comments that you have Another victory for the coin chads. Yeah, this, ha- yeah, this, this, happened, this happened in 2004. So I was thinking to myself, like, I wonder what would have happened if this took place in, like, in, in the era of, like, Facebook. Um, it would have been truly uh, magical. I wonder whether I, my family would have gone bankrupt um, because we because we weren't going to take this guy's. Yeah, I mean, just uh, your shop entirely full of people like this, all filming you and themselves. Yeah, and that too, <laughs> and that too, yeah. wearing um, body cams. Yeah, which is which is like very fun to just think that, like you know, even despite all the sort of like advancements in technology, but crucially, just like how everything is cultural now, the very basics of like how. Um, the local British disputes have not changed in like any form. Oh yeah, we we are a commemorative coin dispute country. Yeah, <laughs> uh, the British version of the Proud Boys is like a bunch of guys who get together with loads of cameras and like weird esoteric ephemera, like commemorative coins, and then film themselves co- committing a minor civil offence while mm. yelling a load of incomprehensible stuff about well, the Magna Carta. You know, it's, it's the same thing as those guys that went into the uh, uh, like vaccine clinic with a copy of the Magna Carta, a copy of the Rome Statute, and we're just like, well, I think you'll find all of these documents are in order. Uh, you are committing crimes against humanity. Thank British, you, have a good day. British people love to yeah. uh, show someone an authority either spurious documents or some kind of like spurious uh, like money. Which it's is rules great. lawyering. It's rules lawyering. It's it's it is deeply it's it is a, a, a something that's deep in the bones of people in this country to think that they've found a technicality that lets them do something annoying. And you know what? Yeah. This guy did. So yeah, congratulations but, to yeah, him. Yeah. You are the freak of the week. I learned a lot about the law from stopthevirus.limewire.scam.kz, <laughs> and um, I think you'll find. But there's mm. another little bit of rules lawyering that lawyering that I want to talk about that's a little more serious and actually pertains a little bit to radicalization as well. Mm. So I want to bring Maria in on this one, which is that a lot of British people seem to have been radicalized by our press into like sovereign citizening their sovereign citizening their way into like egging each other on to committing vehicular homicide. Um, ah, and uh, Maria, as a scholar of extremism, I mean, what sort of goes through your mind when you see? Uh, 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 like radio announcers and columnists and, you know, small business owners all kind of agreeing that they should be able to run people over who get in their way. Well, what runs to my mind is that people are crazy everywhere, you know, because people, I know it's um, groundbreaking research here from, um, from Maria, but people are crazy yeah. everywhere. And you will find this kind of belief all over the world. And the th- reason why I mentioned this is because it just goes to, to my biggest issue that I have with the UK counterterrorism strategy in general is that it doesn't work because it doesn't understand how extremism work. It doesn't understand how people work. People work nowadays, they are radicalized. They think that they know the truth because they read something online. And doesn't matter what the rules say, doesn't matter what the law says. If some guy on Reddit or 4chan or increasingly things like Telegram tell you that you have the right to run somebody over with a car, then they'll think that that's the truth because they read it online. It doesn't matter what the laws are. It matters what people tell you on the little online silo that you belong to. Mm. It's right well, so here we're, we're playing speaking... in the Magna Carta. Abbeus <laughs> uh, Kia Sorrento. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> well, we're speaking, of course, of Insulate Britain. And uh, in the course of these, these protests, the head of Dartford Borough Council yes. came up with my Respect. favorite possible sentence about this, the most sort of British petty officialdom response, which yeah. is, he said, why don't they try uh, gluing themselves to a job? <laughs> That's right. Or, or, That's gluing, right. The, or gluing themselves to something productive that will take our country forwards. I yeah. didn't know that <laughs> well, the mayor why, of Dartford... Why don't they? 
that was, was a fucking them. crying laughing emoji. Yeah. Like, that's who's well, been. well, unlike you, I absolutely did because, well, I have um, not to turn this into the Dartford podcast, but this is very in character uh-huh. to exactly. So when 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 this got sent around and it said the mayor of Dartford Council, I was just like, yeah, you know, I, I know what's, I know what's happening next. They're going to like they are going to uh, do a cry laugh emoji response to uh, all this stuff happening. Mm-hmm. Um, and when someone dies, they're going to or when like when an in, when an insulate Britain protester dies, they are going to erect a big statue of an SUV uh, in the town in the town garden. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 100%. We we went to Mum's basement for comment on the insulate Britain protesters, and they said, "Yo, those guys should try gluing themselves to some pussy for real." Yeah, that is <laughs> kind of something that is that is something a moron would say for sure. <laughs> like, I, it is. I do think it's it's quite interesting how. A, a lot of what we see as radicalization versus not, even as you can see, elected officials, columnists, newspaper uh, uh, anchor, news anchors, and so on, sort of egging people on to commit acts of vehicular murder. Um, you can, it, it's it's sort of quite telling that that is descri- That's all. That's all sort of falls under free speech, and then yeah, being a religious Muslim falls under uh, sort of things that are suspiciously terroristic. I was just thinking about that video. Um, I don't know if you guys saw it. It was um, on Fuel All Side. It was, I can't remember who posted the video, but it was um, it was about the Interlake Britain protest mm. as well. And there was this man who was spraying ink all over the protesters. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And my thought... Oh, the big protest squid. Yes, exactly. And it's like, what? what well, these are people who are peacefully protesting in a way that you might disagree with. And then your, re- your solution is to assault them. And you think that that's okay. And yeah. it's, again, this question of if you flip the script, right? That if you had, let's say, a bunch of soldiers pro- kneeling in front of the cenotaph or something, and a Muslim came and sprayed them with ink in protest, that would clearly be portrayed differently. And there would yeah. be all talks about extremism and prevent. And uh, I wouldn't be surprised even if it was portrayed as a terrorist attack, you know, the great ink terrorist attack. But in this case, the man was hailed as a hero by those who are against the methods of the oh, I, protest. I badly depressed myself looking at the replies to the, you know, the press tweets about that because a more sort of cry laugh emoji sort of response I haven't seen. Uh, yeah. I, yeah. A lot of this like makes sense to me in that, especially because like the fact that it would occur in places like Dartford and stuff is kind of I don't know. Is it on the one hand I think to myself there's like this cultural element where like um, owning a big car and like driving is like a big part of the culture, right? Like so you know I've lived in Dartford for a long time and like lived nearby and like you know all my time there like what you've kind of found is that all these all the like the very minimum public services it has had because this is a Tory this is a Tory safe seat and has been for a long time. Um, all the public services have been like just like decimated over the past decade. You have a bus service that like runs from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. And then if you mm-hmm. don't, and then like if you don't have that, then like again, cry laugh emoji, go get a taxi or whatever. Um, yeah. You know, you have a library that's closed, a museum that's closed, like gardens that are now being developed into like high rise flats that are like half a million pounds each, right? Um, but uh, what I was going to say was that, like, in a lot of cases, like, cars are sort of viewed, like, cars are kind of really protected in this area um, because it's, like, the only way to kind of get around, right? It's the only kind of form mm. of autonomy that people feel that they have. So when they see Insulate Britain on, like, roads and stuff, they what they kind of see is, like, these people are kind of actively trying to make my mis- my already miserable life more miserable. And mm. rather than kind of think about, like, you know, what's going on or why they're doing that, instead they'll kind of, like, it'll just be immediate rage. And, Riley, like, the point you made about, like, the press sort of agging people on until, like, someone gets killed and then they'll, like, you know, inevitably just claim that, like, they never did that and they were just, you know, speaking for the people. Like, I think a lot of it also comes back to the fact that, like, for lots of columnists and journalists, like, they can't actually keep up with the cry laugh emoji like internet culture, right? So they're trying to like, you know, this is where the whole like, you know, speaking up for the people and speaking up for the working class people comes on. What it is is that like they can't keep up with like posting. You're so totally, instead, you're so right. It's like the the the, the thing that uh, you know the Sun or whoever at Talksport or whatever yeah. is competing with isn't like the Mail or the Times or whatever. Yeah. It's the group chat of the guy who sold Milo a car and <laughs> had, a bunch of, had a bunch of memes about yeah. the European Super League that he described as being quite racialist. Yeah. <laughs> 
Right. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. And, and, and like, and just like the bigger thing where they, they can't, they can't keep up with the online discourse. So instead what they're doing is like anticipating it. And like, as we know about online discourse, especially with like on places like Facebook is that it's always going to push you to extremes. So the only way that columnists can really justify their existence is by like white kind of like justifying yeah. and whitewashing the extreme elements before they mm. actually happen. But in a way that like is kind of respectful enough that when something does happen, they can just kind of claim that they never actually advocated violence and like, you know, this is, this is completely out of their hands. I think also we need to think about the role of the government in all this because let's remember that this is the government that has been trying to make progressive extremism a thing. They've been trying to make progressive extremism happen and they are talking about obviously Black Lives Matter protests, but also climate change protests. And the fact that they, they really want this progressive extremism thing to happen. They rely on the media to help them get there. And when the media is competing with the online discourse, as we've been saying, it will always lead you in that direction, in the more extreme mm. direction. And it is playing directly into their hands. The more people get annoyed at um, Insulate Britain, the more people think that they have the right to run them over or spread s- s- squid ink all over them or whatever it was, the more mm. it plays into the hand of a government that is already trying to outlaw that kind of protest. And we'll get it's some more, some more rushed though. legislation. Oh, I, I've been on this too, my <laughs> I know exactly what you're going to say. And I, yeah, my, my third through fifth eyes are yeah. fully open on this one. Like, they do seem deliberately calibrated to be as annoying well, and yet demand nothing as possible. I, I, I have often said that when you talk about that, the person, the first of these drivers who like actually does try to kill an insulate Britain protester with their car will be hailed as a hero until they're charged with assaulting a police officer. <laughs> <laughs> but no, let's let's t- let's get into the meat and potatoes here. Um, I want to talk about prevent. Uh, mm. so before we we crack on uh with 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 prevent, let's get into a little bit of let's get into a little bit of the extremes of how ridiculous it can get. Maria, can you tell me a little bit about the four year old boy who was referred to the Britain's counter terrorism stra- uh, like strategy filter because of he said something about a game of Fortnite. Yes. So th- this is one of my favorite stories. So there are several of those. So the, um, there was um, a young child that was referred to the UK counterterrorism unit. So essentially, since 2015, the UK government instituted a prevent statutory duty. What that means is that um, local authorities, schools, nurseries, um, hospitals, teachers, etc., they have a duty to prevent terrorism. So what that means is that they have a duty mm. to spot signs of extremism and then report those individuals to the prevent board. And those individuals can be as young as three, as four, and they have been as young as four because nurseries have that statutory duty as well. My daughter's nursery has gone through prevent training and that is just absurd in many ways. So there has Why? been- <laughs> Why? Why? They're, Why? They're, they're crafty, you know, because the last person you'd expect to blow you up is a three-year-old child. <laughs> you know, and if I you think know about that. it that way, it's quite uncanny. But my other yeah. argument is that- have you met a three-year-old? They're all insane. They're all extremists. Okay, boy, yeah, they're dangerous. <laughs> they are extremely dangerous. So how are you going to sift through that to find the yeah. one that is, you know, a danger to the state? They're all dangerous to the state. They're insane creatures. <laughs> but um, so there has been the case of the child who was talking about um, his father playing Fortnite or something mm. like it. And the teacher thought they were talking legitimately about the father killing people. So mm. refer them to prevent my favorite story is about the four-year-old that drew a picture at nursery mm. in his preschool. And the teacher asked him what the picture was. And the child said, it's a cooker bomb. And the kid was trying to say a cucumber. And this was, again, a four-year-old, right? And instead of trying to get to the bottom of it, the teacher decided to that maybe perhaps we should refer this four-year-old and their entire family to the counter terrorism program and um child says a word wrong teacher s- jumps across the room slams the button that makes the bars come down over the windows <laughs> draws an ar-15 from under the desk calls pretty patel who comes running in to abduct the child oh absolutely was this teacher a catherine bubble sing <laughs> <laughs> i don't know it feels it feels very much like something she would do 
But like, ju- very much like jumping at shadows, which is, yeah. as we'll see, is going to be kind of a theme here. Yeah. It is, and it's it's also jumping at the wrong shadows because there has been a report that was released a few weeks ago um, by some academics at UCL that did some research on teachers and prevent, and the teachers are saying that um, the prevent training that they get from the government, the prevent support, is absolutely useless because what they are actually seeing in the classroom right now is children from white backgrounds, from Muslim backgrounds, from any background, really spouting conspiracy theories that they're picking up from the internet, really quoting almost word by word QAnon talk points, talking about the vaccine Mm -hmm. being a implant, you know, the Bill Gates implant thing, and Mm -hmm. also extreme misogyny, very much reminiscent of the ideology that you see from the incel community. That's what the teachers are grappling with in the classroom, which is we have seen over and over again is a kind of extremism that is deadly, that kills people and harms people Mm -hmm. on a regular basis. But that is not the focus. The, those who are involved in the prevent statutory duty, you know, at the front of the, the teachers that have to do this by law, whether or not they want to, are saying that the strategy doesn't work and that they're not getting the help that they need to deal with the actual issues that they're seeing in the classroom. Mm. I, th- I think it's great that we made a bunch of like uh, nursery carers and like primary school teachers into counterterrorism police, but also, crucially, <laughs> we didn't tell them anything about how to do it. We just kind of said, mm. "Yeah, go with vibes." Yeah. Uh, what, here, whatever- here's, a, here's a slideshow about like scary Islamic traits you could develop. Yeah. And the training, the prevent training is not regulated. So there are all these different um, private oh, companies. Oh, yes. Yes. I love, I love a sort of like a, a counter terrorism training industry because you, you can just say any old shit. And, like, and they, they do. And they do. Mm. I've had yeah, um, yeah, people yeah. tell me about their counterterrorism. Tra- I've been, you know, in disguise, incognito, into a few of them, and they are all pretty terrible. And I've had one of the worst that I've heard is uh, is um, um, my husband. He used to work as a he worked in an insurance company in the city many years ago, many many years ago now, and he went through prevent training. And some of the things that the people told him, the people delivering the training was, you know, be aware if suddenly a colleague starts going to pray at lunchtime. Or if they wear atomic <laughs> classic hair. sign, yeah. yeah, it's you know if you see somebody praying, you know that they're gonna yeah. blow something. I, I, up. Someone's praying, my lord, call prevent. Exactly, <laughs> somebody's so, praying, I, I, call prevent. But you know if they're praying in a church, it's probably fine. I don't think prevent yeah. covers that. And yeah. you know if they are refusing to go to social events and citing religious reasons for that, uh-huh. mm. all of those things, there are possible signs of radicalization that you have to be aware of. Maybe they're just an introvert. I always refuse to go to social events, and I'll give whatever reason is needed to get out. And maybe that's what, what those people are doing as well. But the, the prevent training industry is completely. I can't immaculate. make it. I'm in ISIS. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Oh, just fun, running, but... running out of excuses, losing the thread a bit, and kind of panicking. Yeah. <laughs> got, a, got a beheading but, to go to. Sorry. But, yeah. So uh, the other thing, right? I think even even then, right? Uh, just sort of circling back to sort of the um the the, the teachers, how this is miss. If this is sort of a bad policy aimed poorly, it's kind of a. Uh, uh, the food is terrible in such small portions, but that sort of ruins mm. people's lives. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. Especially Much because... Like small portions. Right, the... Um, that's not true. Uh, especially <laughs> because um, the... If you say the real problems we're dealing with, sort of like ki- like kids who are being radicalized into QAnon shit by, by their crazy parents or Facebook or whatever, uh, I, I, I doubt the way to deal with that is more cops and surveillance and, you know, unaccountable databases held forever. I don't know. It's right. never gone wrong before. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, it's, the problem is never more counterterrorism powers. That's um, something that people get wrong when um, they read my work or they listen to me talking, you know, because I talk a lot about how the UK government doesn't deal with the far right or extreme misogyny as an, an actual form of terrorism. I don't want more terrorism. I want the terrorism apparatus that we have to be dismantled and we need to start again from scratch because it doesn't work. It hasn't worked for decades. It, I don't think it's ever really worked, and it just creates way more problems than it solves. What's also amazing about Britain is that, like, because because we can't 
we can't spend money on everything. And unlike most right wing governments, that includes the police. We all we can do is give the one cop who's left more powers. Like <laughs> we can't get any more. Like we can provide we can give him more work and more powers, but we can't employ any more. Oh to be England's single remaining cop. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the one police officer is constantly sort of running running after a bus with a little yeah. piece of toast in his mouth and a schoolgirl outfit. It's the last Jew in Kabul, the last cop in <laughs> Britain, yeah. The last cop in Britain, and he shall be their king. Yeah, so let's. <laughs> I want to talk a little bit more about the details of, mm. of Prevent. Right, we've talked around it. Prevent in law is one of the four strands of contest, which is the government's multi-pronged counterterrorism it's strategy. It's a shame they couldn't have had five. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there, there are, we don't like to be too prescriptive, but there are five key pillars to any <laughs> Prevent scheme. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, uh, B boying, uh, MCing, yeah. DJ. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that, well, look, that's the, that's the key to Prevent, right? They they, mm. they went to like Muslims and they were like, look. There are five pillars to your religion. That's a bit much, isn't it? So how how about four? How about four instead? Do you really oh, need really yeah. the streamlining? Yeah. Do you really need Hajj? Yeah. What if you sell one of those pillars and lease it back from yeah. a private company? Yeah, that's how about right. that? So that's right. prevent uh, prevent as we talked about is this the counter extremism policy that a that is aims to like identify people who may at some point um er, commit a terrorist act. The other strands are pursue, prepare, and protect, which are all pretty self-explanatory. But prevent is <laughs> stuff Matt Hancock yep. does every morning. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Prevent this is, is to sort stop of... people being radicalized, which yeah. again, is, mm. is a real thing, right? And like, as as we've said, to, you know, in reference to incels and other stuff, like people get predated upon and people get exploited and get recruited into like uh, violent ideologies. It's just we're very selective about which ones uh, mm. we count as, uh, you know, extremism. Absolutely. Yeah. And the thing is, being anti-radicalization and having some kind of prevention program is brilliant, right? We want to stop people from becoming radicalized. It is very much as you say, Alice, it's a, it's a safeguarding issue. We want to mm. protect people from being brought into radicalization. I'm mm. getting the sense, though, that when we talk about prevent, the safeguarding pa part of that is not going to be entirely sincere. <laughs> it's never been about safeguarding. It's been about safeguarding on paper because it sounds nice, but the way that it's been delivered, it's always been delivered from a security setting from the very mm. very start. So you have you know if if you get into not to get too academic here, but mm. we have this thing in, in security theory called securitization, where you turn something that isn't a security issue, you turn it into a security issue. And that's mm. what Prevent has done. It and grows cops on it like mold. Exactly. Mm. It throws cops at it. It throws counter-radicalization strategies. It, the channel program, which is the official counter-radicalization program in the UK, is extremely secretive. Nobody really knows what it does, but it is an in, mm. like a deprogramming program, essentially, yeah. that you go well, through. It's, it's important in it. a democracy that you don't know, for example, what you might be subject to uh, for saying something like looks like a cucumber and like you know having a little bit of uh, food in your mouth and it coming out wrong. You, well, because that would spoil the surprise. Yeah, exactly. You couldn't possibly <laughs> yeah. want to know. But so the, the, the prevent, so we talked about this, the prevent, pre prevent is this big amorphous thing that's just really about does someone kind of scare you if you have the prevent duty attached to you? And mm. it's, uh, you're, you're engaging in safeguarding. Those Muslims are so spooky. <laughs> yeah. You're engaging in these concepts of safeguarding and, and extremism seem to be the two biggest mm. concepts well, here. Like if, if, if you wanted to be a little bit cynical about this, right? And I, you know, I hate to to tell you, but I might be a bit cynical about this. Given that uh, terrorist attacks have been committed by people who have like been referred to prevent previously, not been referred to prevent previously, uh, one might say that a lot of this is in aid of that one sentence in a BBC news article when an attack happens that goes, "Oh yeah, this guy w was previously referred to prevent." It's sort of like an ass covering measure, but. Uh I think the what they're covering their asses from, right? Let's leave aside safeguarding because we know it's sort of not really. There's not much in there. They're not mm. actually protecting Should vulnerable be, people. They're just there isn't. throwing yeah. cops at them. Extremism is the most slippery term in the whole sort of set of concepts. What they mean by it is, and this is a quote from the actual text of the law itself: active or vocal opposition to fundamental British values, including democracy, the rule of law, individual liberty, and mutual respect and tolerance towards uh, different faiths and beliefs. So the Tory and party then. Yeah, because yeah. <laughs> one thing I like to do is look around Britain and go, "There's so much mutual respect around here." 
Well, it's well, this is one of the things that we were talking about earlier, Alice, right? Where it clearly, as especially as we go through this, what we'll see a lot of is that most of these, most of what the state is doing here is it's trying to use its power to correct how the people's affect. It's trying to make people feel and express the right things. Because as much as throughout all of the different prevent strategies, they talk about um, uh, risk factors for radicalization being things like poverty or social isolation or all these things, mm. all, they have no lever that well, they addiction. can or they want to pull um, mm. that isn't just attempting to police the affect of people, trying mm. to control what they feel and what they can say. Yeah, this is kind of like, a, this is a particularly new Labour vibe for me. Like, And I know yeah. it's something that's existed un, uh, in a totally bipartisan way, but it's always occurred to me that that's a, a particular sort of new Labour bugbear, is this sort of uh, deputy head sort of insistence on respect, right, as a value. You're very yeah. right, and Prevent is a new Labour baby. It was developed under new Labour, and it is a direct outgrowth of the community cohesion strategy developed in 2001, mm. which is, again, New Labour's baby. The Tories obviously have taken and, and run with it, making it into a statutory duty, but it is very much a New Labour thing. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, when you're, at, when you're in uniform, you're representing Britain. <laughs> you get, but the standards of behaviour apply. <laughs> I mean, and so... Let's also think like, um, what happened? Like, what what's one of the things that's happened recently? Right, is because basically ever since two thousand and six, people have been uh, leveling the quite correct criticism that well, prevent just seems to be a way to um, call the police in case someone is slightly too Muslim around you. Mm. Uh, it seems to be that police that, are like, sorry, there's just one guy. It's going to take him a while to get yeah, around. But that that, pe that people have been rightly saying it's very Islamophobic, and I've noticed that a lot of the usual suspects. Um, in British media uh, uh, have been sort of saying, ah, well, actually, they're, they're, it's more sort of people on the far right are getting referred. And I mean, I tend to think that like this is and, and, and this is one of these things where it's one of these machines that just builds itself, right? Yeah, and it, where, it also none of those people have bothered to ask, hmm, why might there be an upswing in like far right recruitment? See, that's the thing that you can't see me, but I'm banging my head against the table yeah. because this thing drives me absolutely up the wall. Prevent referrals for from people from the far right have increased, and recently, I think in the last year and the, the last year's data, it has overtaken the referrals from individuals from the um, from supposedly Islamic extremism, suspected of Islamic extremism. But the thing is, the, the prevent referral data is just one layer because after there is a prevent referral, it goes through a sifting process until it actually gets assessed by a prevent panel. And what has happened over the last few years, I would say, as I think it started in 2016, mm -hmm. the uh, prevent referrals that are considered to be credible referrals from the far right community far outweigh the prevents the referral that are considered to be credible from Islamic mm -hmm. extremism. So for me, that tells that more people are saying, oh my God, that Muslim freaks me out a bit, so I'm going to refer them to prevent. And most of those are not legitimate concerns. And we can mm -hmm. debate whether or not they're legitimate in the first place, but that's for later, but fewer people are referring far right individuals or individuals in danger of being far right extremists, but mm. more of those referrals are valid. So the problem with ex far right extremism in the UK has existed for generations. It has gotten mm. so much worse since Brexit, but there has been more and more referrals for prevent, but prevent, prevent cannot deal with the far right, even though it says mm -hmm. it can. It wasn't designed mm. to deal with the far right. There isn't a single paragraph in the entirety of the prevent strategy papers and there are hundreds and hundreds of these papers and i've read them all there isn't a single paragraph explaining what the far right is what they believe where did they come from and that is contrasted with the hundreds of pages that the government has spent writing on their understanding very prejudiced understanding but their understanding of islam there are simple signs that someone might be getting radicalized to the far right. Uh, they may, for instance, spend more time at the mosque. Uh, they might <laughs> refuse uh, to, to go to events that conflict with their uh, Islamic religious beliefs. There are, uh, Absolutely. I'm, I'm just imagining like the one really overworked guy who works at the Prevent Call Center who's just getting hundreds of calls a day about 
Dr. Kazvani whispering <laughs> people's ears. <laughs> the guy who's overcharging people for soup. Well, yeah. so, Maria, this well, is, there, I, is one, yeah. there is one thing that interests me, though, which is we mentioned sort of uh, like spurious referrals to prevent, like people who are referred to prevent by people who have no real reason to be referring them, and that these, these are sort of like sifted out, right? Is I hope there's no like life ruining consequences for being referred to prevent and then prevent are just like oh yeah you didn't need to do that actually. It's very difficult to tell because it's so secretive. So what, what happens mm -hmm. is when people get referred to prevent, if it's considered to be a credible referral, then they are sent to you know the the actual prevent channel, the panel, I mean, and out of the prevent panel, you can have two outcomes. You can either be referred to the channel program, the deradicalization program, or you get referred to social services or local authorities. And most of the referrals are sent to social services. So things like, you know, somebody needs therapy. They're not an extremist, just the need, they just need therapy. I mean, don't we all, but, um, Get Whether referred to the or not. special podcasting program. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But um but we don't really know what happens to those people who have been referred to prevent and what effect being referred to prevent has on their lives because these things are not secret. They're supposed to be secret, but they're clearly not. Otherwise we wouldn't know about the cucumber boy, the Fortnite boy. We wouldn't know about the girl who said that in her family they didn't celebrate Christmas. She was nine years old and she was also referred to the prevent program because yeah. of that. We don't know what impact that will have on their lives because if we know about it, then I can guarantee that their friends and their community will know about it as well. So mm -hmm. there is an impact and, and who knows what kind of like file, uh, you know, what kind of data that then leads oh, to being kept Alice, on that? I know, absolutely. I, I know, I know, I know that because Liberty recently published um, published a, a, an expose that the Home Office just keeps all of it, every referral. Oh, uh, there's good. a big database of everyone who's ever been referred, regardless so of what if, happens. If you, to them. Next time, next time you interact with the state in any capacity, there has, yeah. there's the possibility that that's just going to flash well, up on the screen. It, you it, get pulled over by the police, and there's a little terrorism flag on the police national computer. You know, you apply yeah. for a job where you have to get a, you know, some kind of like a security clearance or a background check or something, and oh, that's on there that. too. Yeah. Well, it's because the one of the what what some of the logics of like, especially the Home Office, right, which is this. Because prevent is run out of the home office. This sort of this secretive, um, paranoid culture where you're always worried that if you if you do anything other than the harshest thing, that if anything goes wrong, you and everyone will, will know get, will get immediately fired because the right wing press will be out for your blood, right? You, that that it, you of course they're going to basically keep a database of everyone who has been a little bit too Muslim in public, <laughs> um, and. And then obviously secure it poorly and then just have it sort of forever and either uh, lose the part of it that said that you nothing that there was no further action taken. Or maybe it's one of these things and that departments like the home office create these files that just because they're so thick, they means that they need to keep being checked. And every time they're checked or every time they look at you, that adds a little bit of thickness to the file. And it's mm. this kind of surveillance web that it's very, very difficult to escape from. That has mm -hmm. been put on you for basically no reason. And I think it poses a really fundamental question about the nature of our democracy when you cannot trust the government with our national security and with our well-being in all the possible levels at the moment. Because at the end of the day, prevent is a national security strategy. The purpose of it is to keep us safe. It is not doing that, and it is fostering conditions that deal that end up leading to more insecurity to potentially more threat see I, I would actually almost argue uh the opposite not the opposite is happening but that a lot of the national security state really isn't to keep you safe it's actually just to control where the unsafety comes from yeah but, you know, and, like, it, and of course yeah. the most important thing in any government to preserve our phony baloney jobs <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, no you're right but that is like it's too Two perspectives, right? National security should be about our protection, the protection of the people who live in that particular nation state. But in reality, it isn't. It's about control and about power. Yeah. I, I also think about like, this is such a British equivalent to what the security state does in America to sort of preserve and, and expand its own power. It's in America, like they just love to, you know, again, like you know, just call up some like lonely guy pretending to be a woman and be like, hey, I'll, you know, I'll show you my left boob if you go shoot up a mall, and then they can try to stop him, and often won't. Uh, see, like remember, remember like the, the uh, guys who were all trying to kidnap Gretchen Whitmer. It was revealed they were all either police or police informants who were egging one another on to go do this like 
Coen Brothers movie plot for no other reason. Or oh, like, yeah. well, like curiously, that's yeah. that is something that formed a lot of British counterterrorism strategy in Northern Ireland back in the day of just make everyone an informer, and that way uh, you know about everything, but also you're complicit in everything. And we'll yeah. get to the problems with oh. that, you know, when we get to them. We're <laughs> not going to so worry about it. What what I mean, I guess, is is that I sort of see I see sort of just these two separate approaches to accomplishing the same thing, which is really the national security state kind of claim uh, making this sort of uh, uh, claim that it's we're keeping you safe but it's we're either keeping you safe from threats that we're imagining or threats that we're literally creating it, it mm. really does also highlight like the difference in attitudes between britain and america where like i feel like in america they they just love to just go go all out and they love to be like yeah we're basically going to entrap some people into committing a fake crime so we can send them to jail for like a thousand years and that, whereas in Britain, it's kind of like, okay, what we're going to do is, uh, for no reason, put someone on a list for the rest of their life, which obligates them to come and have, like, a meeting at a church hall once a month where they, like, talk to a bored civil servant about, like, their vibes. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to force you to be friends with me. Well, Riley, um, like, you, you mentioned creating threats, but, like, there's there's a couple of dimensions to that that's striking. One is the sort of the obvious foreign policy thing, which is, mm. uh, you know, invade Iraq, invade Libya, invade Afghanistan, whatever. The, but mm. also, the sort of domestic thing, the thing that interests me uh, about this is the sort of, like, the aspect of, of Prevent that we've talked about is kind of like a fig leaf, like the social services aspect, the safeguarding aspect, the things that we know materially can lead to people becoming easier to radicalize, like poverty, for instance. Uh, th the plan for those things is we can never help them. In fact, those always have to get worse, right? Uh, but And so anything that Prevent does, even if it was entirely well-intentioned, which it's not, but even if it were, it would always be playing catch-up, so long as the ideology behind uh, everything else material was, no, that has to get worse. That has to get worse. You can't have a fucking, you know, a bus service or whatever. You can't have a job. Uh, but what you're not allowed to do is to show any kind of sort of disrespect. What we need to consider as well is that Prevent is incredibly successful around the world. And by that, I mean that it's incredibly popular. Prevent has been the inspiration for the U.S.'s Countering Violent Extremism program under President Obama. Countering Violent Extremism around Europe and European countries as well has completely been inspired by Prevent. Within the counterterrorism circles, Prevent is this beautiful, shiny thing that is extremely successful and everybody wants to copy and everybody has copied and I think that is so fascinating because it is a policy that has never really worked, that people on the ground have been saying it doesn't work. It's been criticized over and over and over again. And yet it's still being sold and showcased around the world as the gold standard. Well, what's like what's what's like really instructive to that is also that like they've never the British government have never had to prove that it's like worked either. And every time you sort of just say, hey, like, you know, because I, I when I when I was like doing journalism on this, like I spent kind of two years like trying to cover the prevent me and just like failing at every obstacle and then being like convinced that I was a really bad reporter when it just sort of turned out. But like, no, the way that you sort of like get access to prevent circles is if like you're friends with government ministers or like if like the, if one of the departments wants you to sort of do a puff piece, which is why like mm. the most sort of critical, uh, the most critical like articles about prevent are either ones that come out of like leaks um, like accidental leaks, which tend to be like anecdotes anyway, or they tend to be these puff pieces uh, that like show up in the Times and the Telegraph about like being invited to like a channel meeting or like being invited to like a deradicalization uh, workshop. Um, you know, and then like, and then you find out that oh, like a lot of this was like orchestrated by the Home Office and given to like their special like home uh, home like ho correspondence, right? That was like the big strategy and like. Uh, it, like between 2014 to mm. like 17, I think it's changed like a little bit now where they become even more secretive. A lot of that like has come when the Home Office centralized Prevent in uh, 2011 uh, and where like they kind of like, so where you had like Prevent has never been perfect. It's been like far from it. But like the first iteration of Prevent was very kind of community driven. It was, um, which had its own problems, but like when it kind of went into the home office, it became like much more ideologically driven as far as I could tell. And it was one where like, if you sort of question the logics of prevent or how it worked, um, you would either have like people invested in prevent sort of telling you that you had no idea what you were talking about, but actually, no, I'm not going to explain to you how this works. Um, or you would have 
co- commentators. That's emotional labor. <laughs> right. But if, yeah, if you, but if you, then you'd have commentators and columnists and like, you know, think tank ideologues. Often they're like the same people meshed together who still like use the same lines now, which is like, oh, like if you're kind of anti prevent, then what you're doing is actually just like Islamist sympathy. Um, and you're kind of like legitimizing their view because a lot of the cases, what prevent, and I think I mean, right, like Riley and like Marie, you kind of both touched on this. It was the idea of like preventing the ideological state is one where um, they're trying to kind of like say that, you know, oh, this like Islamist ideology that you kind of, whatever that means and like however legitimate that is, like it is not as kind of like rewarding long-term as like, you know, the Western environment that you exist in. However, it's really hard to make that case when like in a, in a time of austerity, when like you see your community like degrading and falling apart and realizing that you don't have any opportunities and no one in power wants to make that any better. It's really hard to make that case. So then you have like the columnists and like the think tank ideologues who basically ignore all this and will kind of say that any kind of like criticism of prevent and the prevent program as it is, or even just like its ideological underpinnings, um, is ceding to the Islamists. And what needs to happen is prevent needs to be expanded. And that also means giving my think tank more resources to well, get more investment into it. It's so immune to criticism that like these sort of de-radicalization workshops sort of still go unremarked upon, even when there was a terrorist attack at one of them. Yes. <laughs> yeah. you know, it's the it's it's the classic example. Like we talk about sort of uh, it's been exported widely, even though it's not a failure. From the perspective of what sort of the security state wants, I'm hearing mm. only successes, which is the security state needs there to be some attacks because otherwise their their phony baloney mm. jobs don't exist. They don't can't justify having more power, but they also need to have they need to have more power because the thing exists to get more power. It exists to get more power to spy on you. It exists to get more power to fuck with your life, to make you go check in, to make you fill in a form, to get that file bigger on you. Are any of us old enough to remember when members of the security services walked the Manchester Arena bomber through security <laughs> at a UK airport? Because well, I see, do remember that. The thing, the thing about that was that we needed some sort of tame jihadists to uh, to fight in Libya, a, a war mm. of choice that we sort of started, and yeah. we we assumed that we could control them forever. And the, th- the thing about that is, there are no lessons from history that might have taught us otherwise. None. Uh, and therefore, mm. it's a totally forgivable lapse. A guy at MI6 oh, who's doing Ariana Grande guerrilla marketing. <laughs> I, have two, I have two wonderful recently vacant lots in Lower Manhattan to sell you. I don't know why they're there or why they're <laughs> vacant, uh, but boy, do I have them to sell you. you know, um, so mm. this, is, this, is, this is sort of all comes around, right, to this fact that I think actually Prevent is very successful. Because mm. it's a program of no oversight that has enabled the security state to massively tighten its control, kind of based on whatever it feels like doing. And, you know, the, the press creates bogeymen all the time for it. It spent mm. the last 20 years uh, creating sort of a, a Muslim bogeyman. But now if you read The Guardian, you have, a, you have a, someone you can refer to the cops as well, maybe more rightly, who can say. But um, nevertheless, it is these, it's the, it's these, abs- it's the, it's the same ideology. It's the same security state contr- ideology of control. And I mean, if you look at it in history, right, mm. it's, it's in 2000, the terrorism law is created in response to Northern Ireland. In 2003, uh, the first contest law is created in response to 9-11 remain secret. Then after the 7-7 attacks, uh, Marie, I'm quoting from your thesis here. In the aftermath of the attacks, Tony Blair gave a speech claiming that the rules of the game had changed. The country was facing an evil ideology, a battle of hearts, ideas, and minds, and now is the time to defend common values, which is a theme that comes up again and again. Mm. And that speech then gets written into Prevent 2006, which basically says, terrorism, as we conceive of it, is a foreign problem that comes into the UK through Muslim channels and is a threat that is bent on destroying the way we live for no reason that we can fathom. It is simply deranged evil. Mm. I am extremely touched that you read my thesis. It's like you and three other people. So thank you for that. Um, but yeah, Ronnie's actually got some notes for you if you've got. Oh time. please, please go ahead. It would be nicer than my examiners who are like, I think we're exa- you're exaggerating a bit, Maria. It's not that bad. 
So I had to convince him <laughs> that he was that bad. <laughs> this reminds me of something Nate once said to me, which is that when he was on his creative writing MFA, he wrote a story about some uh, high school kids in Indiana in the 90s, which is where he grew up and went to school in the 90s. And they said to tone down the homophobia in the kids' conversations because it's not realistic. And he was like, buddy. <laughs> no, so, uh, but, so, uh, yeah. Maria, let's, let's talk about this. Yeah, so I think it all goes to history and history that I also didn't cover on my thesis, but that I'm covering on the book that I just finished writing. Um which I'm provisionally called Empire of Terror, which is just looking at how the UK has dealt with terrorism since the time of the empire. Great title, by the way. I think it's good too. So if any Asians are listening or publishers, you know, let me know. I have a good title and a good book for you. Mm -hmm. Um, But what what I look at that book is that when... The Terrorism Act 2000 happened. Mm. It, ha- it was the first time the UK had a permanent piece of legislation dealing with terrorism. Previously, we had provisional pieces of legislation dealing with the threat in Northern Ireland. But before that, we had terrorism legislation in the colonies. It was how the British Empire dealt with any kind of dissent in the colonies. You know, the British in India used to shoot people out of cannons that they considered to be terrorists. It was called cannoning. It was quite a thing. And there is a lot of... Um, of, of records that um, that I have looked at where you have empire officials talking about all these people who are against the British Empire in India, they are all terrorists. And people complain about us using the word terrorist, but that's because they don't know what it means. We know what it means. We know a terrorist when we see one. I'm paraphrasing, but that's basically what they say in very posh language. So this idea of the terrorist being an other, a foreign other that is posing some kind of a challenge to the state, the British state, is as old as the empire. And it has filtered through the centuries, really, has filtered through every iteration of terrorism legislation the UK has had and has culminated in the prevent duty, what we have today. Wait, because for Maria, me, yeah, are you I- saying that a method of colonial repression has made its way back to the metropole. <laughs> that <laughs> never I know, that's just shocking, isn't it? Because that is wild. at the core, it's all about nation building, right? It's about mm-hmm. saying who are the good people, who are the good Brits, and who are the outsiders. The empire was not just about colonizing the colonies, but also about reasserting an idea of Britishness, of British identity. Yeah, respect for British values. Exactly. Mm. It was about British values back then. It is about British values now. It has always been the same. So I argue that the prevent strategy in particular and the UK counterterrorism strategy as a whole is just an extension of the empire. It's a modern tool of the empire. Mm. And mm. in many ways, it's highly depressing because it has ha- been happening for over a hundred years. And I personally don't see a way, especially with the kind of government that we have in power, of stopping it. Yeah, well, I don't see my how journey it would into the heart of Africa, I was most disheartened to discover that many of the natives did not understand the key concepts of sportsmanly conduct in cricket. <laughs> and for that reason, we're going to shoot them out of cannons, which was the thing yeah. they actually yeah. did. So, but it's okay. it's it's you it we talk about this as something an empire is doing. It's something that a one. Of, it's something that a, a a sort of a crumbling a crumbling and very insecure feeling empire does because we've decided that there are sort of the, the community syndrome the community of <laughs> acceptable people is getting smaller and smaller mm. and smaller and more and more and more paranoid. Um, and the security state is promising to protect this shrinking community from a growing pool of threats. It's a losing battle. It's a losing battle because what they're doing in the end is that they're fighting reality. You know, they're going against reality. Oh, the, we love that. I yeah. mean, it's... In Britain? It's, oh, boy. What, <laughs> are, you, are you saying that British people are fighting people that they have, they, that exist in their head? Yes, well, they're fighting for a world that entirely Britain exists in their own mind. It's not real. Britain and I'm isn't saying, real. <laughs> and I'm saying that they are fighting against reality in the sense that they are fighting a losing battle you know what they're trying to to create with this this idea of an insular britain you know with the proper british people and the foreigners are all outside it's not a reality it has never been a reality but it's even less of a reality now and that's what they're trying to impose through these measures and it is going to fail eventually it's going to fail but until it gets to that point the amount of suffering that it's going to cause to people the amount of damage and and I'm very clear in this in, in my work in general that this is a type of violence. We 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 can joke about it and we do joke about it because it is so absurd, it's ridiculous. But mm. what prevent does, it commits a form of violence against 
a certain group of people. And it is state-sanctioned violence that is being dressed up as safeguarding. And it's all a process of nation building and social control and about increasing the security state. And it is mm. so harmful. And it is still ongoing because it is touted as this great success because it does what they wanted to do, right? Which is control people. Something I also find interesting, of, I mean, aside from the aspects of it, which are obviously like deliberately malign and the other aspects of it, which are inadvertently malign, um, there's this, there's a, very, there's a very intriguing aspect of like sloppiness to it where like, they're like, well, we're not going to bother to define what a terrorist is. It's like, you're writing a law. <laughs> like, I love the politicians who are just like, oh, lawyers, fucking nerds. They're always trying to define what stuff is <laughs> and what it means. They're fucking losers. But Go see, read a book. You, you always want to have this sort of state of permanent exception, right? Yeah. Like that's yeah. you always want to have this thing where uh, terrorism is such a unique evil that even a law that deals with uh, like evils regularly has to place it in its own separate category, and it requires special measures, and then it requires mm. you to do you know not really fully define what those measures might be, so you can keep yeah. tinkering and adding to them. We need to get all this red tape out of the lawmaking <laughs> process. But also, we want if we want to talk about, I want to go back to this idea of fantasy because essentially what we've done is we've written a fantasy into the law, and and, and this happens mm. numerous times, right? We've written the fantasy into the law that by controlling people's affect, by controlling what they can say and how they can present themselves and stuff uh, through yeah, a network of paranoid snitches, mm. that you can sort of fight the effects of, say, alienation and poverty and all this stuff. But Which also, we're, again, constantly you know, making worse. We, ha we have to make worse, because if you mm. try not to make it worse, that's also terrorism. But uh, that we also say, right, uh, it, it, we talk a lot about foreign policy in the 2006 paper, where we say, yes, that the threat come to the UK comes from different quarters. This is from the, from the paper. Terrorists inspired by Islamist extremism may have come from British communities. In recent years, terrorist suspects investigated in the UK have come originally from countries as diverse as Libya, Algeria, <laughs> Jordan, Saudi Arabia, Iraq, Somalia, and elsewhere. Uh, the first action to counter radicalization lies in addressing structural problems in the UK and elsewhere that may contribute to radicalization. In the UK, this forms part of the government's broader equality agenda. And again, yeah, we, you just don't do the equality agenda, then... Yeah, but you like, say yeah. that it's there, so, yeah. you know... Okay, but second, here's where the foreign policy bit comes in, is they say, is they say look, terrorism is a pro problem that comes from abroad. People are fighting us, despite the fact that we're helpfully intervening in their countries. And mm. you, it sounds like I'm, I'm sort of exaggerating or joking, but barely... Britain is like Microsoft Clippy. It yeah. just shows up and it's like, it seems like you're trying to have some democracy. So here, here's, here's the paragraph. Uh, some argue that the West does not apply consistent standards in its international behavior. Conflicts hmm. such as Bosnia and Chechnya are cited. And it's such a that, fucking yeah. weasel fucking way of, of going like, uh, if, you, if you object to... Uh, you know, bombing Libya or whatever. In fact, you're actually just pushing for more rules-based international yeah. order. <laughs> so, but what they say, right, is that is that if it, uh, addressing that maybe uh, their Western nations are the main aggressors here, that terrorism isn't just this evil ideology up from abroad that hates us for reasons purely within the ideology that comes from abroad and is Muslim, basically, right? They, they have to say, US and UK action in Iraq to remove a serious threat to international security and subsequently promote a democratic and pluralist government, which is going great. It was certainly pluralist in the sense of there are lots are, of people vying to control the territory. Are, are sometimes portrayed as attacks on Islam itself, regardless of the actual rationale for the action. So it's, like it's living in the other fantasy where you get to decide how the invasion of Iraq and Afghanistan get interpreted by everyone around the world. What's an invasion between friends? And I mean, there's also this other domestic aspect to this that I want to talk about really quickly, which is like, wh why would you think that Britain is, you know, an institutionally Islamophobic or institutionally hostile to you place? Uh, you know, not taking into account the, the successive governments being sort of sheepdogged by uh, various sort of tabloids, and in order to like appease them while they publish sort of naked Islamophobia. Going back to that thing in Iraq, I mean, that's that's bad, and it is really bad. That's from 2006, isn't it? My favorite comes from the 2009 strategy when they're talking about um, what happened in Guantanamo Bay and, um, and Abu Ghraib, you know, the, the very clear torture happening there. And <laughs> the way that they frame it in, in the text is like, some may argue that the treatment of detainees was not up to the standards of human rights and like what some may argue some may argue that the torture of people yeah. some terrorists may exactly. argue that so yeah. it's 
fucking pussies. Everything is presented Lips. as everything that could implicate the West in any way when it comes to the motivations of terrorists is presented as a conditional, whilst everything else is presented yeah. as fact. Interestingly, interestingly, by the way, uh, that 2009 strategy, uh, that is where Sajid Javid got the law to strip Shamima Begum of her citizenship uh, and cause the death of her baby. It was the Gordon Brown's 2009 prevent, prevent review that added that the ability to strip citizenship from someone who is deemed to, basic, to be a terrorist threat to the country. Can I just add a quick um, note to that? It's yes, the strategy proposed it. The change in law came in 2014, which is in the British Nationality Act, um, which amended the British Nationality Act. The Immigration Act 2014 amended the British Nationality Act, which meant that you can deprive someone of their citizenship, even if they don't have a second citizenship. Before that, you could you could remove somebody of their remove their citizen, British citizenship if they had a second citizenship already. But the change that came directly, as you said, from that um, argument through Prevent, it came in 2014, is what allowed for Shamima Begum to be deprived of her citizenship because she doesn't have another one but because she could potentially get one then um then that's why um it was it was removed that whole thing about deprivation of citizenship is ridiculous it's it's a, the government is gaslighting people on it because what happens with citizenship right is that um you cannot be a stateless being stateless is an is against the geneva convention so the way that the government has gotten around this is that it's argued and it's argued that in court because it has gone as far as the UK Supreme Court to say that it is not us. It's not us, the state that isn't making you stateless. You are making yourself stateless because you could apply for a second citizenship. You just haven't done so yet. Once again, the deputy head st stuff like it's, it's your own time you're wasting. <laughs> exactly, that's exactly yeah, it. Yeah, is that the well, wall doesn't need your support? It's the, this is. Uh, I found this particularly interesting on a number of levels, both because a, if you genuinely think that Shamima Begum is a dangerous international terrorist, like you can literally let her back into the country and immediately put her in jail. Like mm -hmm. that is like the way in which she doesn't go to jail is you don't let her back into the country. So the security argument just doesn't hold up to any like, again, leaving aside any moral <laughs> questions here. I'm not suggesting yeah. that Shamima Begum yeah. is a genuinely dangerous terrorist. But if if you believe that, yeah. surely you want to put that person in jail. Right. Uh -huh. In which case, the easiest thing to do would be to let her back into the country where you could quite reasonably, again, reasonably in a legal sense, prosecute her under a number of laws about taking part in terrorist activity and put her in jail where she would be under your supervision. No, but th that's the problem. That doesn't fit with the fantasy. You can't put them in jail anymore. They have big, they have big tellies. So uh... <laughs> yeah, it's like an holiday camp. Yeah. She'd be watching beheading videos in Wormwood Scrubs. I'm sure that's going to come as a, as a complete surprise to all of you. But um, the number of people who have been deprived of their citizenship is a secret. You can there is it's not widely available. Huh. There is an estimate of about twenty people that we know of were deprived of their citizenship. Most of them were Muslim yeah. and they were deprived of their citizenship without having a second citizenship as well. So they were made stateless until they sorted right. themselves out. And mm. it's yeah. the the thing that's, I mean, it's all bad, but ne none of those people were charged with any crimes before they were, they had their citizenship removed. They were, had the citizenship removed at the discretion of the home secretary without any kind of due diligence. Yeah. Maria, have you considered what? that these people might have had bad vibes? I mean, I'm sure they did, clearly. Otherwise, <laughs> they would still be British. <laughs> Well, like one thing to remember is also like there are also there were also very there were some organizations that did like make a note of this and like one very notable organization that still kind of does a lot of work in this area happens to be cage like former cage prisoners. Um, and like one of the things that kind of every time they sort of mentioned this, like one of the things that was always kind of come back is that like, well, well, cage are Islamist sympathizers and therefore everything they say, like if you kind of even even if you sort of point it out and like there were journalists like Peter Oborn, for example, who pointed this out, which is like, you know, if this organization has like discovered evidence that the state is kind of like stripping people of citizenship without like in with, with like these secret trials or without like even any sort of like public oversight like this is a really bad thing for democracy and journalists should like maybe consider covering it and it was just remarkable how like even during even during my time covering like the prevent beat and stuff how like i sort of knew that there were certain people that if i quote or certain organizations including cage that if i quoted 
um like my editors would like either spike the piece or just get rid of it entirely like and it, it just I, I mean it kind of on the one hand is like they're very much this thing and we, we've spoken about this in so many contexts before about journalists who are just like massively incurious about how the state works right and that they're also kind of super aware that their jobs are all dependent on proximity and access to power and that means like not kind of questioning any sort of the structural forces of how the state actually works particularly in an area of the state where like it kind of increasingly keeps getting like very well funded and also like very well protected within the home office. Um, and then the other part just being that like reported like media just can't really conceive of this type of stuff happening. Um, and because of like how prevent is structured and because of how secretive is kept, as Maria mentioned, like it's literally impossible to like do any kind of meaningful like FOIA request on them. Um, it means that like these types of very abject demonstrations of the pun like the punitive nature of the state are just kind of either kind of unknown to most of the public or not really contextualized in the right way. I definitely think that like Spy Cops is mm. also a very good example of this, like an investigation that is still ongoing. And there's like one mm. journalist at the Guardian who's like still kind of doing this work. Um, and very, and you know, there was like a Spy Cops incident, there was a Spy Cops story that came out like a few days ago. Um, and like no one really paid attention to it. it so be, I think like, it must yeah. be really difficult to be a Guardian column, a Guardian journalist who like wants to investigate this stuff. You're like mm. frantically typing what, on your laptop while your editor tries to drill through the hard drive from the other <laughs> side. <laughs> but I think it, it goes it goes down to the fact that sort of everyone doing this, all the pol the politicians making the laws about it, and most of the people writing about it and telling you about it basically are just extensions of the security state. And in this case, it is trying to project this fantasy, this strange world mm. where all of the things that the, Briti that the British state wishes were true were true. Because mm. much like our discussion about the Home Office, it kind of takes the same shape, which is where New Labour comes and believes that through sort of closer and finer grained knowledge about what everyone's doing and with more or less unlimited mm. and poorly defined powers to do what they want. They can kind of fix problems technocratically, and then the Tories come in and use those tools to bash the Overton window open, and uh, at, at f much further to the right. So you know this example of when God of, closes you know, a door, He opens an Overton window. <laughs> that's right. That is right. Because right? the New Labour mindset was always that the there's damn Bible. The the the, the, <laughs> the New Labour mindset was that there is no problem they can't solve if they simply had enough authority and information to do so, right? And so this is how you get something like prevent this strange, this strange, unaccountable thing that just sort of collects information on people and shunts them off into different directions that now, by the way, is being sort of fast tracked in the, um, the review of it is being fast tracked in the, in the sort of wake of the killing of David Amos, um, even though the guy was referred to, now it's referred to prevent like nothing happened, obviously. And so they're fast tracking it to sort of, as I understand it, and I'm sort of happy to be corrected by Maria on this. They're fast tracking it to make it much more copish. Um, that, that's as you I. Guys, you guys it. can't uh, obviously because the camera is not on. But I am again banging my head against the desk because how many reviews of Prevent have we had by now? You know, how many more are we going to yeah. have? It's 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 ridiculous. And a lot of the thing that is powering this review as well is this uh, again. <laughs> fantasy this absurdity that prevent is dealing too much with the far right it's like what where'd you guys get that from i'd like to know <laughs> um, because it's it's just absurd and um i don't hold any faith on any prevent review because every prevent review to date and this one is no exception has not spoken to any expert on prevent other than the experts of prevent that are you know state sanctioned they have not spoken they don't care really what we have to say people like me and so many others who have worked on this for so many years and we're not just doing this because we like to trash the government we do it because we care about national security we care about human rights we care about care about national security sounds a bit insane doesn't it but like we care about the world being a safe place and we want national security strategy that is effective but also that protects people and doesn't turn them into terrorists just because they are brown or go to to pray in the middle of the day but i have no faith in any review of prevent that does not speak to the experts and i don't mean that they have to invite me personally mm. i mean i would love that but any expert that works in prevent should be able to participate in the review and to date they haven't so i don't hold any faith on what's going to happen well, uh, if we want to talk briefly, also I think we've about had like, enough of experts, uh, who <laughs> who um who is able to uh, sort of talk and work around prevent? It's one of the other things it does. One of the other reasons why it's so unassailable, mm. in addition to creating the problems that the NatSec community wants to solve, 
in the way that they want to solve them as opposed to in the ways that they actually exist is that also it's like it's um it is absolutely a massive money hole for like the Quilliam, the Henry Jackson Society, Institute for Strategic Dialogue. Oh, yeah, lots of de radicalization guys. For strategic Dialogue. Yeah. Uh, what do they do? Uh, even, or even uh, strategic Hussein, Dialogue. You, yeah, Hussein, yeah, it's you like mentioned Otacon. you mentioned uh, tech against terrorism, where they have oh, a, fuck, a, yeah. an AI platform designed to identify extremist material on the internet um, that like would never never got used. It seems like you're being Muslim. I don't think it was tech against terrorism. I think it was another organization that oh, sounded right. a lot like them who had like, so the government invested, I think like kind of 600,000 pounds into mm. a type of AI that was designed to like, um, to, to like indicate and get rid of like potentially extremist material. Again, like, you know, this was from a Buzzfeed article where they didn't like disclose any like details mm. as to how like it defined extremist terms or like how it were worked and stuff like that. It was, but what seemed to be the case was that they invested a lot of money into this British startup and no platform like Facebook, Twitter and stuff like but no platform like was willing to take it up. So they basically wasted a bunch of money, which likely, like some of it likely came from Prevent to, to like uh, try to champion the software that has no proof of like it working. And like, I was look, trying to look up to see what happened to it. And then oh, I just I can't- mean, Waste prevents money. That's good. I, I, do more of that. Yeah, um, but well, what, and the, but what I was going to say was that like these think tanks and stuff, like they definitely do. And again, like because like the funding structure is so shady and so um, hard to trace, like they will kind of take prevent money from. But because prevent is multi agency, it means that like they can take money from like different departments that are still like technically prevent money, but it doesn't kind of it, you can't really trace it as such, right? So it's really mm. difficult to actually figure out how much mm. prevent money is being why used, is, where and why, why is and, Defra yeah. spending six hundred right. grand on counter radicalization <laughs> algorithms? I, I think you know but, why. But then at the same time, and again, Everyone's this all, packing around here. <laughs> uh, but, but at the same time, and again, this came from a leak in The Guardian a couple of years ago. You have like units like the Research Information and Communications Unit in the oh, Home Office. Nice. They sound uh, cool. Which, which is also linked to Prevent. And what they were doing was then like leasing, serv- where they were kind of like uh, contracting services to uh, uh, a company called Breakthrough Media. Um, you know, it was, just, it was this very big story. Well, it was a big story in like CT spaces, but it didn't really get much kind of play in like other areas, as you can imagine, because British media is entirely incurious. Um, but it was like this shape, this organization that operated out of like this kind of um, very suspect building in Waterloo. Um, and I've been there mm. because they were trying to hire me like at one point. It was very, very funny. <laughs> so, like, you know, that's curious sort- bastards. Is that anything? That's yeah. right. So, like, it's, it, so it's like this really dodgy room where like they're like oh yeah we're kind of a content producer and we're like producing content for marginalized communities um they showed me around a bit and like some of the websites they were looking at were things like muslims with a z at the end which is how you definitely know but like <laughs> yeah this is this is this is yes. like this, yeah this this is like a psyop right so basically um, yeah, it's like what george smiley turns a chair around and say like, hello were, fellow they, muslims right they were trying to basically <laughs> they were trying to do basically like a buzzfeed listicle website where um the whole aim was like this. Wh- where the yeah. whole aim was Which like of to, the five pillars right, are you where, where, where like to empower like british muslim women and stuff and then like a week after i turned down the job because like it was just like really suspicious to me the guardian like releases this article which is like oh yeah by the way this is like a riku related project um and like so it's kind of being centrally funded by the home office but we don't know how much is being funded by it, and we don't really know like who's it's like associated. This, this listicle costs yeah. three hundred thousand pounds but, but the article but the article like very yeah. the, the article like found documents from breakthrough media where it basically very openly said that like our job is to basically kind of like um because it was modeled on like cold war like propaganda units right like yeah. media propaganda units so the oh, whole thing good. was like the whole thing was like you know we're doing the whole like changing hearts and minds thing we're challenging like you know a radical ideology with one of like tolerance and liberalism and like our content is all kind of rooted around that um so they weren't kind of like direct they weren't trying to hide the fact that they were like being funded by prevent but they were trying to obscure it and i think like one thing to bear in mind about had had buzzfeed the soviet (laughs) union would have collapsed in 1920 that's right um that's 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 newsroom season four baby um but look like you know that's i i think it's like an important for like listeners to understand this which is that like one of the big issues about prevent is just how like they sort of operate in plain sight but they operate in such an obscure way but it makes it almost impossible to like really critique it right so 
even like even kind of like counterterrorism consultants who are always like sort of batting for prevent on Twitter and stuff, they will kind of you know so so Maria like mentioned the 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 cucumber cooker bomb story like there were I remember when that story broke how many like CT kind of consultants came on Twitter to be like oh this is like inaccurate reporting they weren't actually pre- re- reported to prevent they were simply just kind of like you know uh, they they were um, they were notified that there could be like a problem and then they were like referred to like uh, they were referred to their head teachers and then their head teachers made the call um, and you know they weren't actually kind of, they basically they were making the argument that they weren't really mm. preferred referred to prevent but they were referred to like channel which is something completely different sure. but they weren't denying mm. that that was the case and like because of the level of obscurity and because it's like even even as like someone who has spent you know I'm sure like I don't know if Maria feels the same way but as like someone who like tried to kind of cover this for two years and then left the job extremely stressed out and like physically sick for months right like it is such a hard thing to kind of get your head around and I think like it is it is it is by design but it's built that way because I think once you sort of like really nail down how this is effective and like how this actually operates you kind of realize that you know again we sort of mentioned that like, this is all kind of built on this very these are all built on like mirages and mirages that no one really buys into and no one's really convinced of and what's interesting now about prevent having to sort of deal with the far right radicalization and like you know um nationalist groups and even even like um you know eco activist groups and stuff is that you can kind of really see how ideologically um ideologically structured prevent is um and how like it's completely inadequate not only to like not only in trying to solve the problem that it's set out to do but also just like in terms of even conceiving what of what like a radical or a threat to the state is and i agree with you completely i am exhausted of working on prevent for so long because you just <laughs> keep on hitting walls over and over again and um and i'm all so it's one of the reasons why i'm moving my research away from prevent towards you know the balmy relaxing waters of white nationalism in the uk because it's <laughs> essentially what i'm doing is switching the focus from looking at how the state is approaching the issue to you know looking more at how the issue is a problem in the first place but um but because it is it when you work in this field, it can be so exhausting because the layers of secrecy, the layers of misinformation that you get told from the government as well. I cannot tell you how many times I've had freedom of information requests denied because to release them would be yeah. aiding and abetting terrorism when I'm just asking simple questions. It's it, it, You do hit a wall and it is exhausting. And no wonder people move away from it. It's important to remain aware of what's going on, but it's not going to change anytime soon. So it's not like our knowledge is going to become obsolete. And there is a lot of work that can be done on prevent if you're not, even if you're not explicitly working on the policy, because working on the policy side and with the the state is just ridiculously exhausting. The thing is, Maria, asking questions and wanting to understand things and how they work is fundamentally contrary to British values. I know. That is true. In that respect, they are absolutely right. That was part of the life of the UK (laughs) test I did years ago, and I I got that question wrong then, and I still do. Mm. Um, uh, But it's it's something like where... um, you know, I, I I I think maybe we can think that maybe the, this new review uh, will be uh, uh, effective in making uh, prevent more effective and humane. Let yeah, me just look at the biography. W- let me one more poem. Let me look at the biography of William Shawcross, uh, formerly of the Henry Jackson Society, who's now leading the independent review of prevent. Mm. His most recent book published called Let me, hang on, let me see here. I assume this will be good. Justice in the Enemy: Nuremberg 9/11 and the Trial of Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. Ooh. Looks, like, look, looks like Nish Kumar's reading something else. <laughs> <laughs> Thank oh. God that man's not an MP. Nish came close there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, so I, I think we can say, yeah, it's uh, it is it, it is it is the machine that builds itself that, mm. um, in a very British this way, machine sucks itself off. Yeah. <laughs> In a very British way, <laughs> it learned how to do it, how to rib remove. It, 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 in a very British way, it is. It's sort of a, a thing that is there just to um, uh, enforce misery and uh, uh, sort of extend, uh, yeah, as we say, colonial violence uh, in the service of a fantasy. Um, and that is just more of how uh, Britain is a dream. It's not a real place. Um, cool. So with all that being said, I want to say, Maria, thank you so much for coming and talking to us today. I had a very good time discussing a very uh, 
unpleasant issue. It was upbeat. <laughs> yeah, we managed to keep it upbeat. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I also had a really good time. It's important to talk about these things, even though it, they are exhausting. But it's also good to talk to people about these things. So it's not just me yelling at the walls in my office about it. So it's it's mm. good to, to, to hear other voices other than my own. <laughs> <laughs> right. Oh, you could have heard so many more voices if you'd have made that. Oh, no, 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 go cut his mic. Cut it's his it's mic. possible there no, were, no, no. There were more people it. here than you first thought. <laughs> no, um, so with all that being said, uh, don't forget we have a Patreon second episode every week cost $5 a month. Uh, you can afford that. It's like this. You can subscribe to it. Yeah. And maybe lose your virginity to sus, mom. <laughs> yeah, well, look. Oh, God, there's look, so many layers. <laughs> look, you can look, look. Right, you can either subscribe on Patreon or you can subscribe using a special commemorative five pound coin. Just mail it yes. to us. Mm. Uh, <laughs> we will take a special commemorative five pound coin. You will have to mail us another five pound coin every month, though. So yeah. <laughs> do be aware of that. Can I put mm. in and, and um, pl- plug my own podcast before I forget? Always. Oh, oh, please. Please. Thank you. So I have a podcast called Enemies of the People, and it's basically about extremism in the 21st century, and it's me in conversation with authors, policymakers, experts, people in general working in the field or experiencing the world that we live in. So it's it's really about how are we living in a fascist society and how can we fix it? And um, I'd love it if you check it out. I am on a mission to leapfrog Nigel Farage in the UK politics podcast mm. charts. And last time I checked, we were enemies of the people on 32nd place in the rankings and he's in 31st. So I am going to beat him. I am going to get away with get it. Get his ass. Get his ass. I will, with your help. So please check <laughs> it That'll out. It'll be another sad day for Nigel Farage. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so- stood in front of a seven-inch TV with a pint. <laughs> Nigel Farage being referred to prevent for endorsing the IRA. <laughs> uh, that's right. Uh, man, when he eventually finds out the queen died, he's going to have such a sad little personal funeral at his house. Yeah. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, I'm very hungry. I'd like to go to eat some dinner. So, mm. Maria, thank you again very much, everybody. No check cucumber that out. in this we one. We will have a link in the description <laughs> uh, to Enemies of the People. Otherwise, uh, we'll see you in a few days on the premium. Bye. Bye, Bye. everyone. Bye. Bye.